This is Daylight Fleets by Jay Wilburn. The dark fleet of ships drew toward the shore above the deserted harbor. The coastline village of True Haven Harbor looked as deserted as the previous villages this terrible armada had visited in recent days. Most of the villages along the coast and throughout the islands were stripped bare of life after each invasion. Now villagers who heard and believed the legends of the terrible fleet were fleeing ahead of its arrival. Still, the human crewmen loaded up their tenders and made for shore to investigate in the noon light. The land ahead looked deathly still. The ships behind rocked and creaked at the end of their anchor chains. The hulls appeared so black, even in the sunlight, so that so that they could have been built from night itself as opposed to wood. The ragtag crew speared onto the lonely and lonely sand and climbed out together as they crossed the dunes and then the grass between them and the first structures. Abram Cocker, known by his by friends and enemies as Old Ram, led out in the middle of the shore party. He had been the pirate captain of the Cry Havoc. He still sailed that ship and ordered the surviving crew during the day, but he held no illusions that he was still captain. Such honors were only truly held by the Midnight Men now. To his right, Libertine, a former officer of the Good Answer, kept pace with Old Ram. To his left, a cabin boy from a ship Ram couldn't recall looked around nervous. The rest of the day crew followed close behind. Libertine asked, isn't this your former village, Cricket? The boy cleared his throat a couple times before answering, in another life, yes, sir. Old Ram didn't know the boy's name beyond the moniker of Cricket. Um, the pa they passed between the buildings. Doors and windows stood open as if to show there was no life left inside. They past abandoned carts, a smattering of scattered goods, and other rubbish spilled and not cleaned up by whomever left here in a hurry. The mixed company of former men of honor and former men of simple thievery continued on together behind Ram, Libertine, and Cricket. A large stone church rose into view just beyond the town square they approached. It was a dominant thing, built from much stone and seemed quite out of place in the otherwise humble village. The grand church structure, like a fortress to God, was topped by an enormous white cross made from rough, unpolished stone. The doors of this building hung open on an empty sanctuary. That would have been the place to hide and fight from. Odd, old Ram said. Most of the folks of this faith of this faithful most most of the folks this faithful to the old time religion are farther north libertine sighed and said if we don't start finding people soon older gods will begin to feed upon us old ram answered with a grunt and then added we better hunt up a few living souls then i suspect these wily villagers are not have not are not wandered far we might be able to flush them out of the woods or we can act as if we are sailing north and stop short letting them return on their own do you think Lear will be patient with that plan, Captain Cocker? Libertine did not look at Ram as he asked the question. He seemed to be looking for villagers under a broken bench. Cricket let out a little whine like a dog. Ram might have swatted the boy for it on any other day, but he himself was feeling the part of a beaten dog this sunny afternoon. As I gather, Lear does not speak any languages men use today. Now Libertine did consider the pirate captain before he said, The others are happy to translate our failures to him. Aye, that they are. Maybe we should see if the god of that old rugged cross still cares for our souls. Libertine's shoulder twitched and he looked away. Old Ram liked that reaction. Cricket let out another high noise from the back of his throat. Old Ram considered delivering that swat again, but then the boy pointed and spoke. There, see him? They looked ahead, and both the pirate and the former officer must have seen the figure at the same second, for they went from normal pace and squinting to wide eyes and stuttered steps. In a chair that had been dragged out from one of the buildings to the center of the square in front of the church, an old man crouched in the seat with his arms folded and his head bowed. He was the only person of True Haven Harbor anywhere to be seen. He, always, he almost blended in with the dusty stone around him. As the party drew closer, Old Ram went from thinking the fellow was dead to sleeping to sitting and watching them come to him. Ram settled on the conclusion that this man was mad. Perhaps they left the village idiot as a sacrifice to the fleet of the dead as the rest of the village took to the trees and the hills. 
Old Ram let the sole of his boot scrape on the gritty cobbles just shy of the old man's bare feet. The old fellow lifted his wrinkled face and pale eyes on Ram and the rest. He was so sallow and colorless that he could have fit in just fine with Lear's people. "'Introduce yourself, sir,' Ram said. The fellow swallowed but did not speak. He didn't look away. He didn't make a move. Old Ram turned to Cricket and asked, "'Do you recognize this fellow from the days of your old life? He looks ancient enough to have been sitting in this chair since before the village was made.' Cricket nodded and said, "'He's called Glamour.' "'What sort of name is that?' Libertine asked. Cricket said, "'He's an oracle. He can tell the future.' Libertine lifted his eyes to the cross as if to confirm which faith this village claimed. Ram pr practically hooted at that fun fact. Is that so? Tell me the future then, my good glamour, sir. The old man said, Death, it comes. Ram snorted, and other crewmen laughed behind him. I imagine many could have guessed that. Do you have more, sir? It comes soon, but not quick. That sounds like a riddle, one of the men said from behind the captain. Not a very difficult one, Ram said. Do you know how death will come? I believe I can tell you if you aren't sure. Glamour blinked slowly and asked, for me or for you? Ram narrowed his eyes. I imagine I'd outlive you, even if this weren't the last day for True Haven Harbor. You see only to the end of your nose, Glamour said, and that will be your undoing. Enlighten me then, Oracle. Tell me my fate, since I already know yours. Bait, the old man said. Old Ram shook his head and said, what's that? The cries rose up behind him. But by the time Ram started to turn, the unseen attackers had him on the ground with the others. His bad day had only just begun. As night fell, True Haven Harbor grew quiet once more, and appeared as deserted as it had when the landing came ashore. Soft moans and cries lifted muffled into the dying light. Insects and other night creatures joined the ominous chorus. The, the dark ships continued their percussion of slow tilting this way tilting this way and that upon the waves. Not too many ships to count, but they hurt the eyes to look upon too closely as night fell. The dark paint covered the former names of these vessels. Among them were the faded letters of fine, honorable names, such as the Good Answer, Quick Hawk, Highest Tide, Trinity Hope, Violet Skies, the Dandy, and many more. A dozen different flags for as many nations flapped torn, ragged, and forgotten upon black masts. More than a few trading companies and admirals wondered about the fate of these vanished ships. Others along this coast knew all too well what had happened. In amongst the honorable names, capable ships with feared names sat anchored as well. The Cry Havoc, Savage Jewel, Terror's Cup, Blackbird Glory, Bloody Rambler, and more sat ready for a different sort of raid upon this quiet evening shore. Some of the night crew awoke as the last of the purple light faded from the horizon. They crawled out upon the many decks and looked across the water at the lightless shore. No signal torches greeted them. They turned about, scanning, for their, own, scanning their own ships for the lowly day crew. Not a warm soul showed itself. Lear kept his eyes locked upon shore. His chest and one shoulder grew out large and misshapen like his bones were swelling with tumors. No shirt or coat would fit him any longer, so he did not bother to wear them. His skin was paler than a fish's belly. Folds, wrinkles, and knots in that colorless flesh had grown hard with time. Lear's eyes glowed red in the, in the deep sockets surrounding, surrounded by drooping flesh. The corners of his mouth went back too far, almost to his ears. He showed too many discolored teeth, as if he had never been human at all. His hair, what remained of it, long, hung long, stringy, and white. Compared to his lifeless skin, his hair almost looked yellow-gray. Lear's speckled tongues licked out around impossible fangs as he considered this night. He saw the tenders still beached in the sand. No crew showed themselves there either. As his eyes adjusted, he saw further and spied living men lifted above the ground, extending their arms like warm-blooded scarecrows. The ancient creature did not look away and barked, and barked an order to his lessers in a language from a long-dead people. He knew a few words in modern tongues by accident, but he saw no need to learn the languages of men who would be here today and gone tomorrow, along with their temporary civilizations like ash upon the wind. Several other creatures turned to move below deck to carry out his order. They all were his lessers, after all. 
A maddening scent reached his nose and his eyes glowed brighter. Fresh blood, veins and arteries had been opened just now by living men upon the shore. The day crew had come through finally. Whatever battle they had to fight in order to bring this feast, it had apparently continued into nightfall. The others took to the air and flew out across the water. Lear growled. He was to feed first, but the smell of fresh spilled blood in these quantities was too much for his kind. He soared out himself, not to be left behind. The lesser creatures who had gone below deck now flew behind him as well, crying out at his back. Lear landed to find several men lifted upon crosses. They moaned and groaned through gags over their mouths. Being this close to this symbol of faith weakened Lear a little. It wasn't the end all of stopping his kind, like some humans thought, but he still did not enjoy the drain on his energy. As they bled down the poles of their crosses, the others from the night crew climbed up and sunk their fangs into the exposed necks and lapped the blood already leaking from, fresh, from their fresh wounds. Not to be left out, Lear floated up and looked into the terrified face of a dirty bearded man. Lear unhinged his jaw and exposed fangs like sabers. Then, through his bloodlust, he recognized the face. Lear ripped away the gag over Captain Abram Old Ram Cocker's face mouth. The black claws at the ends of his pale fingers raked bloody furrows down Ram's cheek. The former cab captain of the Cry Havoc, who once begged for his life and agreed to serve Lear and his immortal kind for the rest of his days, now stammered out trap. This trap. Lear understood none of it. The other vampires who searched below deck landed at the foot of Old Ram's cross. They spoke over one another, and in their panic they spoke in languages Lear would not understand, even if they they had gone. Uh, I got a, got a typo here. Almost made it through, about halfway before I found a typo. All right. Would not understand, even if they'd gone one at, one at a time. He stared down at them and then over their heads to the abandoned ships on the water. Only half of the complement of vampires, cr uh, vampire crew had come ashore. Where were the rest? His voice boomed with the question in his ancient tongue. The vampires on the ground switched to words Lear could comprehend. They still spoke over one another. Dead, staked, murdered someone while we slept a trap. Metal teeth locked down on both of Lear's wrists and he growled out in ang animal rage and pain. As he thrashed to free himself, he felt weaker and weaker until he dangled in the air from the jaws of the trap. He, he started to cry out, but then looked up in shock as smoke boiled out of his wounds. Silver. The teeth of the trap itself were made of silver. How did such a thing exist? How had this unremarkable village found enough silver and in the, and in the, skill, and the skill to craft this abomination? He started to cry again, but then saw the others hanging by arms or legs or shoulders from silver traps just like his. Free me, he could barely whisper the words now. The small group of free vampires on the ground stepped forward to release the oldest among them. A tw the twang of taut leather sent thick wooden sta sta shafts into the chests of the free vampires. They staggered as the, w as the wood in their hearts and lungs robbed them of strength. Lear watched as their eyes darkened. He guessed his eyes were dimming as well, and it filled him with the dark rage he no longer had the strength to express properly. The silver and the crosses were too much in combination. Lear started to feel real fear, but it had been so long that he confused the emotion for pain and weakness from the trap. Humans, lowly villagers, stepped into view. The vampires with the thick arrows staked into the, them reached out with black claws to fight again fight back with the last of their strength but the common villagers pushed the weakened vampires to the ground before Lear's feet below Lear's feet the ancient vampire struggled against the silver trap locked over and biting into his forearms he managed to twist in place but came nowhere near freeing himself he tried to kick one of the closest villagers, a boy, but he could not summon the strength to lift his hanging leg that high. Then he swore he recognized the boy. All humans looked mostly alike to him, though, and his vision was starting to blur. The devious ambushing humans did not cut off the heads of the wounded vampires on the ground. Instead, they hammered metal stakes into the earth and then snapped silver traps over the ankles of the last few fallen immortals. 
Lear growled out threats and promises to the horrid, warm-blooded pest that circled around him, as if he were nothing to fear. His voice broke three times, but he continued to rant. They can't understand you, the boy Lear had tried to kick said to him. Lear actually understood the words. He fell silent, fighting the urge to close his eyes and drift away. It wasn't Lear's native tongue from eons ago, but it was an old language he did know. Now he recognized the boy. It was one of the cabin boys from one of the many crews Lear and his fellows had attacked on the high seas at night. Most of the men from each of those attacks was fed upon until dry, torn to pieces, and tossed on the water to feed the things living in the darkness below. A rare few over the centuries were turned. They were very rare, and only, repl and only to replace the others who fell in unlucky accidents. A few more humans were spared to in exchange for becoming the day crew to guard while Lear slept to prepare the next meal and to scout new territories for feeding grounds Lear had grown weary of hiding and staying landlocked he had decided with other like-minded vampires that humans were to be enjoyed even if their numbers dwindled as a result the night the earth and the seas would belong to the immortals Lear blinked away the weird blurriness in his vision but it was but it only subsided a little this boy had turned on him and now he hung vulnerable from such a simple snare he growled out at the traitor child in the less ancient language the boys had under had used the boy that the day crew called cricket waved lear off like he were an annoyance instead of the oldest and most powerful being in, in all the world Cricket said, I only understand a little. You speak too fast. I don't care what you have to say, either. This was my village, and you won't have it. Lear peeled back his lips and showed his fangs, which were already retreating, into the ducks hidden in the roof of his mouth. He wanted to tear the boy apart. He wanted to scream. He wanted to scream out more threats, but he had but he had not had not the energy so this old monster slumped o under his trap the other humans p moved away stabbing spears into the bodies of the day crew they had hung upon the cheap lashed together crosses as bait as the muffled screams died away the human villagers used other tools to remove the heads of the bitten crewmen they would not have a chance to turn old ram whose gag had been removed screamed the loudest he begged and cried for his life more than the day lear had offered him grace to become part of his day crew he did not understand ram's words but he knew their intent lear had not had a chance to bite ram but the old pirate's head tumbled to the ground anyway at least his begging was over libertine on the other side hung his head and exposed his neck to make it easier on the villagers it was almost as if he decided he deserved and welcomed death like a long-awaited friend Maybe his death was honorable, but Lear hated him for that quiet acceptance. Yet Lear, uh, yet Lear waited for his end to come. But the humans kept their distance and left the vampires languishing in the silver traps. A few younger men used the tenders to sail out to the ships. They brought back some, some treasure, but not much. As Lear watched, the great ships lilted to one side or the other, and one by one they sunk below the waters. As his fleet diminished, Lear thought about the vampires who had been staked and killed in their sleep. If these crafty villagers had time to do that, why not end, end them all instead of waiting for them to wake up and come ashore? Lear called out to the humans who wouldn't even look at him. He cried out to the vampires suspended around him for them to translate. Most wouldn't open their eyes, and even the ones who did would not look at him either. When the sun started to rise in the east, out over the water through the masts still sticking still sticking from the watery grave of the fleet lear started to suspect why they had lured him ashore the sky took on colors that he did that did not look real to him he did not remember what sunrise looked like even before that top rim of the fiery orb of death broke the horizon his skin started to smoke and burn in places not touching the silver now lear remembered what fear was from his ancient past other vampires cried out and begged for mercy like common worthless humans the sun rose and rose until it shined bright and terrible in his face lear tried to twist away but had no strength the world became an inferno of endless pain even he started to scream for death in the language of his long ago youth his skin blackened softened peeled away in chunks just to expose more raw spots that burned and smoked anew even his bone showing 
even his bones showed through ruined flesh and charred muscle the bones even as his even as bone showed through ruined flesh and charred muscle the bones smoked burned and hurt soon his bones were as black as the ships he used to command without fear his fangs sprung and tore away the burned carbon of his lips the fangs blackened too Lear was not sure when he lost consciousness, but he awoke to renewed pain. He did not have a single nerve left in his body, but as he awoke to the sun falling to the west, he hurt and he hurt again. As night approached, he felt new, felt new energy building inside him. If he could free himself, he would show these little short-lived creatures that he could still make them suffer, even after he cooked in the sun all day. As he turned his blurry eyes from side to side, he saw the humans now removing the heads of the charred vampires they had trapped here to suffer all day. They came to Lear last and faced him. The vampire tried to move try and tried to speak, but he had no working muscles left anywhere in his body. It was the cabin boy, Cricket, who swung the blade and removed Lear's head, making that little boy one of the greatest vampire slayers of all time. No one had ever killed one as old as Lear, and probably never would again. Cricket, who was who the other boys of True Haven Harbor knew as Trig, dropped the blade and fell to his knees crying. It was over. The long nightmare of serving these blood-sucking monsters was finally over. Every last one of them was gone. The, the ships they had stolen and repurposed as floating tombs sunk too. The villagers of his true home had succeeded where countless others had failed. His friends, Sim, Alcott, and Dell, lifted Trig to his feet and guided him toward the water. Trig went on crying without knowing where they were going or why. As they reached the water's edge in the last light of the late afternoon, Trig wiped his eyes. He tried to turn to look upon his friends, but they held him tight. His breath caught, and he looked from side to side. What's going on? We won. It's over. It's almost over, Sim said. Alcott, on his other side, said, Just hold still and, and don't fight. What do you mean? Trig demanded. I fought for you. I fought with you. I sent warning that they were coming. I'm one of you. What are you doing? You were one of them, Sim said. Trig started to struggle, but couldn't free himself. More hands fell on him. Alcott said, Don't fight. You'll make it worse. Make make what worse? I helped you. I saved you all. Tell me what you're doing. Dell kicked the back of Trigg's legs and dropped him to his knees in the wet sand. Everyone you, everyone you helped these monsters, everyone who helped those monsters even a little must pay for everything. Everyone who died. At their unholy claws and fangs. I was a victim too, Trigg said. They held me against my will. I was a slave, not a crewman. Let me go. You're only alive because I warned you and told you what you must do to kill them. I helped you. You owe me. Let me go. As his friends held on, Trigg twisted his head to yell for the adults and the village elders to help him. What he saw was the whole village standing grim-faced behind him. He did not see his family. He only had an uncle, a few cousins, and one great aunt still living. That was why he went to sea in the first place. He cried out for them to save him, but he heard no answer from them or anyone else. His friends and a few others dragged him out beyond waist deep in the ocean. Trigg, who was called Cricket upon the water, struggled, cried, and begged. As hands took hold of his hair and bent his face toward the water, he repeated over and over, They made me, they made me, they made me. They pushed his head under and held him there without pulling him out or letting him up again. He tried to hold his breath, but he had cried out so much before going under that his heart beat too fast for that. His eyes went wide as he breathed in water, and his life became heavy and blurry. None of his final thoughts came in complete sentences, but there was a rush of emotions and images that seemed to drag out forever as his life slipped away. Through the water under the surface he saw the outlines of the dark ships resting on the sandy floor. In those dim waters he saw shapes climb out of the holes in the hulls of the wreckage. He could not think much as his body shut down, but he thought he might be imagining it until the glowing red eyes turned his way under the water. It wasn't quite sundown, but when it, wa when it was full dark, these monsters, the people of True Haven Harbor, had missed in the previous night and day would emerge. He had one last weak burst of dark hope go through his disconnected thoughts. He hoped they all would suffer for this. Darkness fell and then rose again. <laughs>